everyone for, for tolerating the Zoom authentication process. Um, clearly that was one hurdle that we hadn't anticipated. Uh, this afternoon's workshop is sponsored by the Open Life Sciences, and this is a workshop about accessibility inclusion for visual impairment. The co-organizers for this event are Yo, Marianne, and myself, Maz. Um, um, Yo, actually over to you to, to introduce yourself and say a little bit more about, about why this event came about. Thank you so much, Mez. Uh, so um, thank you everyone who's here today, especially those of you who've been very, very patient while we were figuring out our tech issues. Uh, so Open Life Science, we're an organization that's dedicated to, to helping people disseminate science in open and inclusive ways. Um, and as part of that, it's very important that we look at our communities, we recognize who is present, who isn't present, and what we can do to break down those barriers. Uh, an important part of that also is recognizing that, um, wow, mine has blanked partway through a sentence, that's nice, uh, recognizing that when, we're that when we're working together as a team, that we, yeah, okay, I can't recover from this. <laughs> I'm just going to try and move on um, and say that we really, really value educating ourselves about ways that we can make our communities more inclusive. It finally came. All right. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop looking flustered and confused and just say thank you to everyone who's come. Uh, this will be recorded and edited on YouTube so that anyone can actually follow on um, and learn from this later with a corrected transcript that's been manually correct corrected to make sure that it's accessible to as many people as possible. Thank you, uh, Maz. I think the other part that we were thinking about when we were um, organizing the event was how we can advocate for each other and where that needs to start and certainly part of the work so Marianne and myself are both based at Advanced Research Computing at Durham uh, and we we are involved with several groups that that seek to do that one of which Marianne do you want to say a little bit about the Women HBC group sorry just to put you on the spot I can. Yes. Um, so in um, the N8 partnership, um, we are involved in the Women in HPC chapter, um, which is seeking to especially um, make the uh, computationally intensive research community more diverse, more inclusive and more accessible. And we've been involved in a in number of working groups. And so and this is um, one of our uh, attempts to take action and actually do something at it and chip away on this huge issue and um, do little steps um, towards, um, yeah, getting more inclusive in our research community. And before we get into our first speaker, so we have three panelists here today, uh, Chris Owen, Teresa Loftus and Alex Barker. Teresa and, and Alex are based at AbilityNet and, and Chris um, I've forgotten what your specific job title is, but you're coming up next, so you get to introduce yourself and I will not be so flustered, which is great. But, but another observation that we had as, as a group was that we are spending a lot of our time, despite coming out of COVID, in either hybrid um, experiences, so online and also in person at the same time, but also still a lot of our time in digital spaces as well, and really thinking through what accessibility but advocacy means in those kinds of spaces becomes quite complex very quickly. So we wanted to start with, with visual impairment and that's a good segue into our first speaker this afternoon. Chris, over to you. I'm sorry I'm leaving it to you to introduce yourself by your own job title. <laughs> I think that's part of your presentation anyway, so this is smooth. <laughs> Yeah, so, so it's, it's as if we planned it, really. It is. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, I'm... Hey, on, Chris, your audio is cutting out just a little bit. Sorry, that's because I've got my reader is just talking over. Once I've once I've got everything set up, I'll be able to turn my reader off. And then, um, uh, so just for everybody on the call, for your awareness, I am actually visually impaired. So I, I use uh, voiceover when I'm using my my my, um, my laptop. So it's just talking to me to make sure that I'm sharing the correct thing. So you might hear me dip in and out just while I get set up, and then hopefully it will settle down once I turn the speech off. So thank you. <laughs> So, yeah. 
we can see your slides as a slide deck, not quite presenter mode yet, but we can see um, some. That's great stuff. That's good stuff. So if I turn the speak, and then I should be able to now present. Perfect. You're in presenter mode, Chris. That looks great. Thank you. Lovely. That's great stuff. That's a good start. So, um, yes, thank you for inviting me really to talk. Uh, as I say, my name is Chris Owen. I'm a, uh, I work in automotive finance. I'm a product owner uh, with many years history of business analysis. Um, I'm really excited to come and talk to you today. Uh, as, as I said, I, I am registered blind and uh, with a degenerative condition. And so to have this opportunity to talk to you from first-hand experience, I think is hopefully it will be, it will be valuable to, to yourselves. So just a quick agenda, uh, as I say, I'm gonna just give a quick background to me uh, and who I am, where my history is, how my sight loss has, has, has you know, sort of developed. Um, and then what I wanted to do was actually jump into a brief whistle-stop history of visual impairments and accessibility uh, and with a couple of case studies there. And that will then sort of bring us on to the final piece around actual accessible development and the importance as well of business engagement with these developments um, before, before finally closing there. I think um, with regard to questions, I understand we're gonna be doing questions at the end. So if you have anything, then please raise it in the chat and we can pick it up at the once we've all spoken and during the Q&A session at the end there. Um, the other point as well, I would like to just raise quickly, these slides have um, timings on them, which is why they've just jumped forward. Um, but these slides are, are accessible as well. So if anybody needs copies, then please let me know and I can, and I can share them with you. So from a background, um, as I said, I have got uh, a macular disease and, um, uh, and I was diagnosed in 2018 with a degenerative condition called cone dystrophy. It's a genetic condition and it is, uh, and the, gen the gene is uh, something called GUCY2D. So I was diagnosed, as I say, in 2018 and in 2020, I stopped driving. Uh, in middle of last year, 2021, I was registered as sight impaired. And then in December of last year, I was registered as severely sight impaired. So what does that mean? It means that I now walk with a white cane. I use a long white cane when I'm navigating around. I use assisted travel, so I take advantage of all of the um, uh, the assistance when moving, when when navigating train stations, commuting to and from work, and traveling around the country. Uh, I'm on the waiting list for a guide dog, and hopefully within the next year I will have a guide dog which will help me with that as well. From a technical perspective, uh, I use screen magnification, which I'll come on to shortly. And, and that I use that as, as you can probably tell, combined with text to speech as well. When I'm watching TV, I have audio description switched on. And when I'm using my phone, I use the inbuilt voiceover functionality there as well. As I said, I've got 20 years experience as a product owner and as a business analyst. And um, really over the past few years, as my sight loss has degenerated, that's really helped me to, to focus on really making awareness of accessibility and sight loss and disability, which is what I use. And there's, uh, I have a website called The Blind Man with a Backpack and social media, and you can you can find out more on there. Um, so just to talk about my sight loss, the, in the middle of the screen, you'll see an eye. That is my right eye. Just to the right of that, you'll see a large white light. That's where the optic nerve joins the back of the, uh, the, back of the retina. And then to the left of that, there's a black patch which has got some white speckling inside it. That is my macula. That is the that is the cause of my sight loss. So that small part of the eye, uh, about the size of a grain of rice, is what controls your central, your detailed vision, your color vision, and all of that. And that is what, for me, is degrading and is causing me to be blind. So to put that in perspective, literally. Uh, in May, I started using magnification and I was magnifying about 200% at that point. So that's about a quarter of a screen. So you can see already that it's it's taken up quite a lot of the screen, but you can just about see where you are when you're navigating around and, and it's not too much of an impact. But then quite quickly, I'm jumping up to 300%. And so when you're starting to get to these kind of levels, it's one ninth of the screen. It's not too bad, but it's starting to get more and more difficult. 
by February, I'm at 500%. And 500% magnification is, yeah, that, that's when actually voiceover comes in because when you've got one twenty-fifth of a screen on, 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 um, on display, it's very difficult to navigate around. And that's where, you, that's where really speech comes in to, in order to talk back to you, to give you the feedback, to really see uh, and to really understand where you are when you're working around and working on these devices. And that takes me on to now. So now I'm at 800%. So I have less than 2% of my screen is visible at a time. And here, basically, I no longer use a mouse. When you're, when you're magnified at this age, actually, a mouse is quite useless. So you no longer use a mouse. You're reliant on keystrokes and, um, as I say, on voiceover. And this is where really accessible design, when you're talking about website design and application design, this is where at this kind of level, the, the, the importance of having that accessible solution really does start to kick in there. So just jumping back, I'll jump back to 100%. I won't keep you at, at, at the 800% level. Um, just jumping back, just to give you a brief history of accessibility for visually impaired people. Now, here we have six examples. The top three, I think everybody, on this call will probably be very, very familiar with, and they're sort of synonymous with people who are visually impaired. Um, the first one has been Braille. It's been around for 200 years, developed by a gentleman called Louis Braille, who, who uh, lost his sight as an accident when he was young. What you might not know is that actually Braille is used in less than 1% of blind and visually impaired people in the UK. So even though it's something which is almost stereotypical, the thing which everybody who is blind uses, it's used by very, very few people. Likewise, the white cane. So this has been around since the early 1920s. Uh, the gentleman, James Beek, who invented it, uh, he, he basically, he had a, a walking stick. He was worried when he was walking around Bristol, his hometown, that he would be you know, he, he, he'd get into an accident. And so he basically painted his walking stick white. That has then developed over time to the long white cane that people are more familiar with now. But again, actually, from a, from a usage perspective, numbers are sketchy, but it's less, significantly less than 10% of blind or visually impaired people actually use a long white cane. And then, of course, the final one is the guide dog. Now, the guide dog, again, it's been, it, was, it had its 90th anniversary last year. Uh, the first guide dogs have been trained. Um, they are, I suppose, they're, they're, again, they're one of the big things that people look at access with dogs. And, you know, people think blind people with, 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 with their guide dogs. But there are only actually 4, 000, less than 5,000 working guide dogs in the UK. Now, when you take that into perspective, there are 350,000 registered blind or, severe, or sight impaired people in the UK. So the number of guide dogs or the percentage of gut people with a guide dog is, is again, it's very, very small there. Across the bottom are other accessible designs or accessibility um, items, which you might not realize or, or maybe not realize they actually were originally designed as accessible tools. So the first one was the audio book. It, it was developed, or the first ones were started to be shipped in the mid 1930s. Um, it came from a captain, or the originator was Captain Ian Fraser, who worked, uh, who, who, who lost his sight during the First World War. Um, and he worked with the then National Institute of Blind to develop an audio book reader and, and audio book technology. Now, 15% of Britons actually use audiobooks. So it's it's become a staple of 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 um of, of the mainstream if you like. It's not it's it's not simply an accessibility tool anymore. Likewise with text to speech, as I said, it's something which I'm use I use all the time for when I'm uh, when I'm using any kind of technology. These have been around for a long time, but now it's something which is just a staple. I'm sure potentially a lot of people on this call will be familiar with things like um, Microsoft Word or Microsoft Office with the latest uh, uh, read aloud function that you can have in there. They probably, if you're, if you're driving and you receive a text message, you might ask your phone to read the SMS out to you. You may even ask your smart speaker or something like that to read out a recipe while you're cooking dinner or something like that. So 
it, it's something which has become much more than just accessible technology. And the same really with voice control as well. I mean, that was developed for people who who were unable to use a computer with a you know, paraplegic or, or paralyzed, so they were unable to use keyboards the, the way the way that you know they need to. And so voice control was built in. And again, you know, with the development of smart speakers and smart controls, uh, we we use we use voice control in our cars, in our households, on our phones, on basically just about every kind of part of our um uh, part of our existence now. So I just want to jump into a couple of case studies here uh, and talk a couple. So the first one I wanted to delve into was actually the humble cane. Now, as I said at the top, I, I use a humble cane. I use a, a long white cane to get around. Um, and really it was built, it, the purpose of it was it had three areas. First of all, to be seen. If you see somebody walking around with a white cane, generally most people realize that that's because they they are have a visual impairment um or we have a visual impairment you might not know as well that sometimes you'll see it with a red mark around it as well that means that you've got a dual um sensory impairment so typically it, or that means that you're both have both sight loss and hearing loss um it's designed to find obstacles so it is suitably long you can't just go and buy a white cane you have to get one which is the correct length for you uh, and be trained to use it so as somebody who is six foot tall I have a cane which is 150 meet, 150 centimeters, sorry, not 150 meters, 150 centimeters long. And that means that it's long enough that when it finds an obstacle in good time, so that I'm not walking straight into it. Uh, and finally, the feedback that you get from it, both tactile and audible feedback, actually helps you to navigate safely. So the tactile feedback will be uh how it how it um when you're reaching things like curbs so that you can reach a curb safely you'll be able to hear it as it changes surfaces from a footpath to going onto grass to to um you know coming up to a puddle or in or, or anything like that so all of those all of those sort of um elements there are are combined in order to help you to navigate safely and and uh, around around your environment so on the right hand side there are a few other developments around some of them more um some of them more effective than others but you've got a few other developments there so the first one and this was for me this was a game changer was the shock absorbing handle so this means as you're walking up if you find an obstacle um because you can you hold it slightly in front of your stomach you can be if you're walking too quickly you can get um you can get bruised shall we say um so the shock absorbing handle it slightly recoils when you touch an obstacle which means that you have time to step back and stop and 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 not get not get injured so much lightweight materials again this is some real developments here and so you have uh the canes that i use are either aluminium or they are um or they're graphite so they're nice and lightweight you've got interchangeable tips which are based on the different environments you're in so if you've got if you're indoors you might use a smaller tip out and about i tend to have quite a large roller ball and i've even got a hook so when i'm going off off, off road or I'm walking through the woods with the family with the dog um I can use that and that and that's a much easier one to work work uh off road um and they're foldable as well so when you're not using it you can fold it you can put it away and then you're not having to have this long cane lying around and everywhere and falling over and getting in people's way at the bottom are a couple of other developments which you'd think would actually be real um real benefits but when you start to delve into it they they have they have some challenges so for example the radar so the purpose of this is actually it will beep much like a reversing sensor on a car it will make a noise when you're coming up to an obstacle so you don't get the problem of actually walking into things the problem is we as i said you when using a cane you have you're focused so much on the audible feedback, you're listening to the environment, you're listening for, for dangers for cars and other people and so forth. To have something else to be listening out for that causes a real, it, it takes away one of your key senses there. So actually it's it's a bit of a challenge there. The other one about illuminated shafts. So at night, again, it means that you can be seen, but for people like myself who isn't completely blind, but have um, very severe, sight loss uh and you when walking around at night you need all of your senses and to have a bright light 
in front of you where it just takes away any kind of vision that you have, any kind of useful vision you may have. The other problem with these two, actually, ironically, is because the cane is used so much and because it is, you know, you're, 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 it, it's hitting into obstacles, it's being, it's being um, swiped left to right all the time, these things are heavily reliant on intricate technology and intricate wiring and, and electronics, and those two things don't really go well together, which means that they don't have a particularly good shelf life. So I think there's a lot more development that can be done there in order to make them really, really effective there. So moving on from the cane, I wanted to look at the audio book. So apparently, again, Captain Ian Fraser, when he um, when, when he was sat in his convalescence home after the war, he was sat getting frustrated, not being able to read, unable to learn Braille, and apparently he just shouted out if books can only talk. So bringing that forward into a user story, uh, into sort of uh, technology speak and his element speak. So as a user story, we can look at this and we can go well, as a blind person, I would like to be able to listen to a book so that I can continue to enjoy reading. Now, the problem in the early 20th century of that was these expensive gramophone discs ran at 78 RPM and you could only play a maximum of five minutes per side. So if you take something like um, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone that was you know, read out by, by Stephen Fry very, very well, that's nine hours and 33 minutes long which means that that would take 115 sides of gramophone discs or 58 discs. So imagine that you get you, you, to, to listen to that, you're constantly changing. Every five minutes you're changing sides. You'd need an entire library just to store one book. So it really wasn't very effective there. So the objective of, of um, the team who worked on it and they worked in conjunction with uh, who is now the um, uh, the Royal National Institute for, of, of Blind People or, or the RNIB uh, was to develop a cheap disc and a player and the disc had to store up to 30 minutes per side. So that meant that that reduced that those those 58 discs down to 10. So what they built was a 24 RPM gramophone disc. It was they, they pulled the grooves closer together but they also needed to build a player, so they had to make it multi-speed, so it played 24 RPMs, it could play your original 78s, um, 45s, and other types of discs that were that were in, the, in, in use at the time. And then, so after years and years of development, the first audio books were shipped free of charge to blind and visually impaired people um, in around 1935. So what has that got to do with business engagement. So the thing about both of those uh, both both of those um, items is they were actually built with visually impaired people at the core and really working closely with those visually impaired communities to build a solution that was fit for purpose and worked for for them. So if we think about how we move that forward, so if you look at sort of going from requirements all the way through to solution, um, by doing that early engagement and raising that awareness early, what you're able to do and working with that visually impaired community, what you're really able to do as well is very early on identifying where these benefits won't just meet the visually impaired or, or people like myself, visually impaired users, but it will meet the wider, you know, support the wider business community as well, the wiser user base as well. And actually, rather than so often when we're doing design, we're focusing on the how, but this makes us focus on the what. It makes us focus on the outcomes and what results we're really kind of looking for there. And with that, it means that when we get into requirements definition, we are divine, defining those functional requirements which have got accessibility at the core. And because we've had the, 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 the key business stakeholders and the user communities involved from the very beginning, it means that actually you're keeping that priority to remain in scope so that these things don't potentially get de-scoped as you go further through into the build. So then when you do get to delivery and you do get design and build, then it, it means that you've got those strong, robust requirements which are in place and you can, you can build your solution knowing what those desired outcomes are. Um, and knowing those user behaviours as well, so that then again, when you're thinking about the, the ability and the um, uh, and making it accessible, you you understand what those users' behaviours really really are there. So just as an example, 
if you think about something like a, um, uh, a customer relationship management system or a CRM system, there is there may well be a need for a user uh, who is speaking to a customer. There may be a need that they've got to update a customer's personal information. So they need to open up a screen. They need to go into edit mode. They need to change the details and then they need to save. Typically, you would do that by using a mouse and a series of clicks. But actually, to make that accessible, the bed, what you would need to do is build in um, alternative approaches to that, such as you know, using keystroke shortcut keys to go into that edit screen, making sure that everything is tagged correctly with the right metadata. So as, as somebody is tabbing through the screen, they can hear what field it is that they need to update. And then they're able to make the changes that they need and then go do, a, do, a, do a, a very simple save again using another shortcut potentially. Now, of course, that means that you've got a solution which works perfectly for somebody who's visually impaired, but by having those, those keystrokes in place, you're also able to, if, you, if you're highlighting those in your training material and your user do documentation, it's things which are there available to save time and to save effort for everybody who's using that system not just those visually impaired people like myself. So thinking about then the benefits, just finally sort of to close, you've got really business-led accessible design will often deliver those benefits to the wider organization. Um, and it gives the business users and the end users that ownership of the end solution and, you know, and that, that sense of empowerment and ownership and, and what have you there. But also, more importantly, it demonstrates you've got an organisation that is committed to inclusivity and diversity, and actually is committed to working with those um, with, with the with people like the visually impaired users. But and and that leads to obviously the most important piece there, which is you're delivering solutions which are better suited to the specific needs of users like myself who are visually impaired. So, I hope. That has been of use. I'd just like to finish by saying thank you. Uh, as I said, I, I, if you're interested in reading um, about accessibility or around um, uh, technology or, 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 or disability or mental health or anything, then please visit my website, blindmanwithabackpack.uk. I'm on Inst I'm on online on social media, so so you can contact me there. Or please feel free if you'd like to talk further, drop me an email at Chris at blindmanwithabackpack.uk. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for that. Um, and yeah, just to, to reiterate and prompt people or nudge people, I think is the technical term, to go to Chris's website. So I've been reading your, your blogs lately, Chris, and, and one of your latest blog posts is disabled in enabled world um and you have another one as well uh, more recently than that which i was just reading um which is your agatha christie post um yeah. there's a I, I really like how you talk about disability and certainly in your in your in your in your last most recently two posts that you have put on your blog looked at the social construction of disability there um it's it's really powerful work and you know does demonstrate how within organizations um but even individually um you know we we can have a, a greater awareness and also make a difference um thank you so much um if i could ask you to stop sharing your screen that will be i will definitely try and do that um, okay. yes. <laughs> no think that's the button there yeah okay I think there. <laughs> um I've put the link to Chris's website in the chat and I'll repost that again as well um as as we go through the webinar so you don't lose it um our next speakers today are Teresa and Alex from AbilityNet and this is more of a formal organization now please correct me if I'm wrong um that looks specifically at disability and disability support and what organizations can do uh, and you're going to talk to us a bit from that perspective so Teresa and Alex over to you please thank you um right I'm going to share my screen so bear with me while I set myself up and uh that's always a a, a tricky one to start with and two ticks while I just get everything in front of me as well. I can't always see everybody while I'm presenting as well. So I'm just going to set myself up so I can see people too, a few people anyway. Yeah. 
So um, thank you for, for joining Alex and I, and uh, we are from AbilityNet and uh, here to talk to you about vision impairment and specifically accessibility and inclusion awareness. So I'm hoping everybody can see the screen now um, with our starter. So my name is Teresa Loftus. I'm the assessment team manager at AbilityNet. I've been with them for just over 10 years, but have 20 years experience of assistive technology. I started my own assistive technology learning when working with blind and visually impaired children in mainstream education, and then moved on to working with AbilityNet to, to deliver workplace assessments and disabled student assessments. I've also organized staff training and delivered a range of webinars such as this as well. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure, thanks, Teresa. So my name is Alex Barker, and I am the disability consultant for AbilityNet. I've been with AbilityNet for nearly 20 years. And in my current role, uh, I try to help disabled people get the information they need to use technology more effectively. Um, and I'm also uh, talking all the time with organizations to make sure they are providing the right technology for their clients to, to use. Lovely, thank you, Alex. So, Alex, I've just gone on to the next screen. Yep. So, do you want to do a bit of sure. a welcome here as okay. well? So, we've got live transcriptions during so live captions during the online event, and you can toggle them on or off. Uh, slides, a transcript, and a recording will be made available. Please use the QA window to ask questions and a feedback would be available to ask any favorite questions post event. Okay, thank you, Alex. So um, about AbilityNet, so in brief, we are a charity that uses technology to help transform the lives of disabled people at home, at work and in education. And we do this through accessibility testing and training, workplace consultancy and assessments, education consultancy and DSA assessments, free services such as IT and accessibility help at home and online resources, blogs, events and webinars. So please do dip into our website and see if there's anything of interest to you. There's lots of free resources available there. So on to the next slide. So today this will be a whistle stop tour of why it's important to be accessible and inclusive. We'll speak about the language we use around visual impairments, introduce you to some of the assistive technology tools, speak about accessibility check-in and provide information with regards to funding as well. So Alex, next slide over to you. Okay, thanks Teresa. So why is it important? Well, there was some really uh, fascinating facts here. The estimated number of children and young people with vision impairment in the UK, ages from 0 to 25, is 40,947, so nearly 41,000. And approximately 7 in 10 children and young people with vision impairments are educated in mainstream schools. One in every 1,000 students, either in higher education or university, in the UK has risen impairment, and that is information from the Procton Trust. Over to you, Theresa. So really consider this, 38% of young people aged 16 to 25 who are long-term disabled with a seeing difficulty are, are not in employment, not in education, or in training and they call that a neat and they're almost twice as likely to be neat as the general population of 16 to 25 year olds. So what is a visual impairment? So there's six categories and these are related to the Snell and Visual Acuity System. They are mild, moderate, severe, profound, near total and total. And if you're provided with these details, then you can begin to build an idea of the barriers that could exist. So what do those numbers mean that we can see here were of mild 20, um, 20, 30 vision? So the top number refers to your distance in feet from the chart and the bottom number indicates the distance at which a person with normal eyesight can re read the same line. So it was, for example, 
Um, if you have 20-30 vision, it means your vision is worse than average. When you're standing 20 feet from the chart, you can read letters that most people can see when they are 30 feet away. And I would say that is very limited information because you need a little bit more. Um, so you should also consider the type of visual condition as well. So for instance, it could be flashes and floaters, it could be stargarts, it could be nystagmus or cataracts. And each condition means that somebody will need access to information differently. Maybe they need magnification, a larger screen, speech output, a handheld magnifier. Everybody is different and one size does not meet all. So don't make assumptions. Alex, can you provide a little bit more context here as well, please, about your own visual impairment? Sure, okay. So I've got quite a rare condition called Meebra syndrome, and uh, it causes many issues. But specifically for my uh, eyesight, my facial, um, my cranial nerves are paralyzed, so I can't show any facial expression. Consequently, I can't move my eyes left or right my uh, eyesight is okay to get around and i can see a car or a bus but i am not able to see a car registration plate at whatever the uh, uh the limit is i think it's something like 20 feet so i would not be able to drive but i can get around so um I'm visually impaired. I would guess that I'm probably mild to moderately impaired, but I work with other people who are totally visually impaired or near total. And I think what's really interesting is that when you use the term visually impaired, you could be talking about all sorts of people with all sorts of particular issues. And it's and it's it's a good idea not just to make assumptions. Okay. And um, now we go on to language. And language is really tricky, isn't it, Teresa? Because sometimes uh, I've got a vision impaired colleague. In fact, I've got two. And we will say, nice to see you. Well, my colleague can't actually see me. And... In conversation, many people are awkward and hyper aware of common used phrases that refer to sight. This is phrasing, using phrases like nice to see you or see you soon is a nightly cause of offence. But more negative phrases such as blind drunk or the blind leading the blind should be avoided. Many people also, we well, about describing things to people who are blind using visual language, such as colours. Again, this is unlikely to cause event, uh, offence. Not every blind person has zero vision, and it's not unusual to be able to distinguish some colour. Many blind people have lost their sight over time, so a colour is still a useful detail. Even if someone has never seen a colour, they have usually learned about the colours associated with objects and will have their own mental image of what a colour looks like. So describing an object, including its colour, will provide useful information. And don't be scared of getting it wrong or causing offence. OK, so we've got a top tip here as well, Alex, haven't we? Yeah. Do you want to share uh, that? Sure, of course I can. So our top tips, introduce yourself. This makes sure the person you are talking to has understood that you're speaking to them. Say hello or hi when you enter a room. This helps them to orientate themselves and know where you are if they need anything. Please don't grab them by the hand in an attempt to help. Perhaps say hi, can I help them? They would be the one to judge. Giving directions over there or here can mean nothing. So provide landmarks. James is sitting two chairs to the left of you. And and what I would say is, you know, I use the phrase "see you soon" 
is a good turn of phrase that I think nothing about, and it's a phrase that I use on the phone. So for example, when I'm talking to someone, maybe not in a work environment, but well, when I talk to my parents or when I talk to an aunt or auntie, uncle, uh, I might say, see you soon, see you soon. And it's just something that's crept into our, our, our vocabulary. Yeah, it's just a turn of phrase, isn't it, Alex, it's, that we commonly use? Sure. And, yeah, and, and it's quite an acceptable common, commonly used phrase as well. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. And uh, I thought it'd be nice to have a little bit more context as well of a lived experience too. So we've heard about Alex a little bit, um, but uh, we're going to introduce you to one of our colleagues at work here, Addy. He's one of our AbilityNet um, accessibility consultants and he's blind and uses assistive technology at work. When I got to university, things changed. Um, the world became digital and there was a piece of software called the screen reader that was created which allowed someone blind to have the digital world read out to them. So at university I was able to use a laptop and my screen reader and that allowed me to read the PowerPoint slides my lecturers would be using. It allowed me to write my reports and do my coursework by myself for the first time. I still needed help at university because um, not all books were electronic and uh, also a lot of the times there was graphs and, and diagrams as part of my course which were hard for the screen reader to, to, to read to me um, so I would have sighted assistance um, with stuff like that. Navigating around the university campus was a little bit challenging as well trying to find the right buildings and the right rooms uh, in the buildings so um, there, there was there was still a bit of a um, a struggle well at university but the fact that I could use a laptop and I was able to read and write for myself um, at times was an incredible incredible improvement okay. so, oh go on Alex so let's think so so we've heard from Addy's experience and I can a bit of my experience but the great thing is is that it's fairly easy to improve accessibility. So let's give a, a couple of examples. Using a keyboard is often much user uh, faster than using a mouse. By knowing the keyboard shortcuts, you reduce the need to track a pointer and can speed up identifying menu options. Think about the steps to save a document or a pointer and compare this with hitting Control S. If someone uses a screen reader, they will be using their keyboard all the time. And what they're going to be doing is they will be tabbing around the screen to hear what to do next or listen to content. Control S is so much quicker. However, it may be just by changing the font size, color and creating a way to locate it with a trail is all that's required. It's really frustrating if you can't find the pointer and have to shake the mouse every time you try and find it. Precious time can be saved by some simple adjustments found in ease of access in the windows. If you're unsure how to access this, then please do use AbilityNet My Computer My Way uh, website. So moving on to the next slide is My Computer My Way. So basically um, what My Computer My Way does, it helps you make small changes to the computer or device that you're using to give you big wins. So for example, if you are in fact, what we're going to do, we're going to share the screen and I will show. Well, if we you. wait until the end, Alex, and uh, we'll uh, share yeah, our screen um, at the end. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what, we're going, what we'll do at the end is we will actually demonstrate my computer my way. But say, for example, you've got, uh, you've got a visual impairment. You can type risen impairment into the search bar and it will give you ideas of how to make your computer uh, a little bit easier to use. 
it can uh, guess what device you're using. So you might be using Windows 10, or you might be using iOS, or you might be using Android. And it gives you step-by-step -step guides, but it will also give you quick guides just in case you're a bit more computer literate. As I say, my computer, my way is totally free of charge. Anyone can use it and it can help you get more out of your device. Yeah, it's a brilliant one, isn't it? I've done many workplace assessments and uh, we've recommended this um, within the workplace and uh, work through some of those solutions while sitting next to somebody. And they, as a result of that, have said, oh, this is going to be really useful. I'm going to take it home because not only does it help with um, changing the computer settings, it's also about tablets and phones sure. as well so it's a really helpful sort of like tool that can be used by family it's free it's a good good resource isn't it and as we said Alex is going to show you a little bit about it and how it how how you can search something on there in a minute and, so, oh. and, uh, and the really good thing about it is that it demonstrates how quickly you can make changes to your device that can make a real impact yeah okay i'm going to move on to the next slide alex yep so um are you aware that accessibility features are standard within windows and apple so i'm sure you know that it feels like it's quite commonly known but actually very often it isn't and uh, i focused on microsoft office here as this is most commonly used in universities so narrator within windows and voiceover in apple these read everything on the screen via text to speech and typically you tap around the screen if you are a screen reader and use other elements of the keyboard too any text that appears under the focus is read aloud However, this alone doesn't always provide functionality to access everything that you need. So other specialist software might be needed to uh, be considered. And that could be things like JAWS, typically used for somebody who is blind and uh, who just wants to listen to the information on the screen. Or it could be Zoom text or Supernova by Dolphin. And uh, these pieces of software integrate both sort of magnification and speech output as well. So they change the environment to make it in far more accessible. And it could be about sort of inverting colors or creating a color that's um, yellow and blue, for instance. So a, a yellow background, blue text or the other way around. So it's changing that to make it far more accessible for you and something that you can't do alone just in the Windows settings. So you might need to go that one step further with specialist software. When you're creating docu documents as well, it's a good way um, to check your documents using speech output. And uh, by sort of, um, you, you could do, do it without using the mouse and uh, you, you can then have a look at the structure. So using speech output allows you to sort of tab around and work out what the structure of your document is. And uh, might sound a bit strange, but, uh, it, it helps you to understand where the issues could be. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. There's also magnification. And have you tried zooming in with magnifier in Windows? To quickly turn on magnifier, press the Windows logo plus the, sign, the plus sign. And to turn the magnifier off again, press the Windows logo plus the escape. So you can switch that on and off. In using this, you might find that some documents spill over the screen and make them difficult to read. And again, we'll come back to this shortly. And how about trying the color contrasts in Window 11, Windows 11? Try pressing the Alt key plus the left shift key plus print screen to quickly turn high contrast mode on or off. Again, my computer, my way will help, my way will help you make these adjustments. Um, there's full instructions as how to adapt your technology, whether that's laptop, desktop, tablet or phone. Sure. And I think what we've noticed is that, you know, on these few introductions to accessibility, you may have found some barriers. It's extremely frustrating to find inaccessible websites or that documents are difficult to navigate when just using the keyboard. Often the structure is poor, whereby you'll start a page in the middle using your assistive technology and the tab focus will flip up and down 
on the screen, which makes listening to the information really hard. Also, images may not be described accurately or just aren't required. Again, this slows down consideration of text, making the learning process slow and frustrating and reliant on others to provide help. So what can you do to help ensure that accessibility is available? Then it's worth checking the platforms and websites for accessibility statements. You'll be looking, you'll be looking for a WCAG or WCAG workout statement or repack statement. There may be some that say they are not fully compliant, but in the process of making improvements. And when creating your own documents and resources, run an accessibility checker. I can't stress how important this is. Microsoft has this inbuilt. It's easy and quick to use. Have a look in the review tab in Microsoft Word and PowerPoint and also found on the message ribbon in Outlook. You'll be advised what to do as it checks your document for accessibility. PDFs are very different. As a flat document, they are very difficult when accessibility is concerned. And we do have a course on PDF accessibility to provide some guidance on making accessible PDFs. And you can find that information on our website. OK, so we've touched on ways in which you can provide help, but sometimes specialist technology is required and this may be software or hardware and then training may also be needed too. So there's DSA and ATW and uh, that's Disabled Student Allowance and Access to Work and they're government funded schemes that can help. DSA is for students in higher education and Access to Work is in the workplace. And again, we have fact sheets on that if you're not quite sure um, which one applies to you or, or what they do to help you. So, um, I'll go summarise what we've learnt. So, from this training today, we've learned about the importance of accessibility and inclusion. We've learned about communication and interaction strategies. We've learned about some of the free assistive technology to help reduce vision impairment barriers. We've spoken about accessibility checking, websites, platforms, documents and resources. And lastly, we've looked at access additional funding for specialist support software and hardware. OK. And then quickly, I'll just run through some useful links and resources. So we spoke about the AbilityNet fact sheets. So again, straight away onto our website and you can find some information about those. So if you're not sure about the sort of technology that's needed or, uh, or a condition or um, you can have a look at our fact sheets that can help you that. And it's quite a good stepping stone to then go into using my computer my way. We've spoken about access to work. And we've also referenced Pockling to Trust quite a bit. So that's quite a useful resource to have a look at. The other one that's really good and, and I often refer to when I'm investigating maybe eye conditions is the Moorfields eye website. Do have a look at that because it lists quite a lot of the different eye conditions there that you might come across. And then we spoke about the AbilityNet PDF accessibility course. I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and Alex, I'm going to let you pick up here if is that okay and you can go yeah. on to the my computer my way site okay so i'm going to stop sharing okay. you okay yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna start sharing uh let's just have a look okay so i'm just going to just i'm just going to go into my computer my way here we are right and so, uh, as you, as Ooh, you can, not quite on my computer, my way website there, Alex. I'm not right. sure whether you've shared the wrong screen. And um, let me just, right, let, let me just go back. Let me just try again. Right. Can you see my computer, my way? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay. So uh, we're not going to actually demonstrate this because when we try to demonstrate it, it, if you're screen sharing, it doesn't make any difference and you can't see what's happening. So just to 
have a look. So we wanted to add trails to the mouse pointer in Windows 11. There is a short guide, so it says open in the settings app by pressing the Windows logo key. And it tells you what to do. But what it also does, and it shows you how it started off before, and it moves on to how it looks after. But what it does, if you're not very computer literate, don't worry about it because there is a step by step guide. So it talks about it talks about um, going into device settings, talks about clicking additional mouse options, and it tells you about enabling pointer trails. And you can also change the trail length of your mouse. And then you can close the window. And it actually talks about lots of different things from getting voiceover to work, from getting narrator to work, or getting magnification and pointer trails to work. And when, I, when I'm actually talking to people uh, on the phone or maybe an email, the easiest way to actually demonstrate what they can do is to point them towards my computer my way and i think it's been on our website for about maybe eight or ten years and i think it's one of the best resources that ability net can offer you don't you teresa oh i think it's a great free resource yes absolutely and as i said it's uh, it's useful in many settings as well so i think that's brought us to the end of our presentation alex hasn't it yeah, yeah. So, thank you thank you very much Hooray, I couldn't <laughs> unmute myself. That was, <laughs> I was, I was floundering there. Alec, Teresa, thank you so much. And also hooray for your talk too. So thank you very much for that. Um, we've, we've had some questions in the chat and people have also been writing um, onto our notepad as well. So please, if you have, if you have questions, please continue to add them into the chat or into the notepad. And um, I'm just going to start, Chris, with some questions for you. The first one was, was sort of an observation and a question at the same time, which was your slide that showed the different layers of technology of, 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 across sort of different decades, particularly the voice control one in the 1930s. We, and myself and this other person, we can't imagine how this could work pre-home computers. So talk us through voice control pre the tech that we're used to today. How does that work? So, I mean, it was, I, I must admit, I'm no expert. So, um, it, it, it's, it, but basically it was developed, uh, we're using, um, I can't remember, it was, it was when I, when I did the research. So you, you had, um, you were, you, they were using very, uh, almost, um, it was linked in with gramophone pieces as well. And so you could almost, you could build, and by listening to, I think it, it listened to fluctuations of uh, of your voice, which would then lead to very simple commands, which would then be able to control. So it's not like voice control that you and I would think about today, like when we're using Siri or something like that, but by, by listening to the fluctuations in your voice and in, in, you know, in sort of the sound waves and things, from from what I remember, um, with my very limited research, uh, it it um, it was able to then make some very basic controls of of uh, of various sort of pieces of equipment and things like that. And actually, sorry, I'm 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 remembering quickly, and so it's it's my brain is suddenly clicking back into focus a bit more. It used. Lit, lit bits and pieces like sort of puffing and pulling as well so that would be not necessarily voice control but more mouth control or you know other senses to to control turning devices on and off and things like that yeah. impressive i yeah. will find the website and i will i will share it um, please up. do please oh so, yeah just that level of innovation there just seems mm. amazing <laughs> i know it was quite amazing when i, when I read it myself it's just like are you sure <laughs> Check state. <laughs> <laughs> and a question to, to Alex, Teresa and Chris, so to the whole panel, in your use of adapted technology that, that, that you currently use, has that been taken up by your family or friends or other workers and modified or changed from the way that they were intended to be used? So I've got a personal example 
in my in my household, my my my, my daughter um, is is very keen on having subtitles on. Now she's she's not deaf, but she likes subtitles when she's watching television. It helps with her focus and it sort of helps calm her as well. And I kind of I share her disposition in that way. Do you have any experiences like that where you're using an assistive or adaptive technology, but actually it's being used by extended family, friends, loved ones, other other people that you work with, but in, in different ways, not necessarily to support a disability? Um, uh, uh, okay, go on, Chris. No, no, you carry on, you start. Okay. And um, I, I love anything that's classed as smart technology, uh, especially a I can't, I can't say her name before she'll start working, but she's called Alexa. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, I don't think I, I don't think she was ever designed to help disabled people, but people have picked up the metaphorical baton and they've run with it, and they and, and now they're going, okay, so I might find it difficult to reach up and turn lights on, or mm. I might find it difficult to um unlock a door if i if i'm housebound why can't we get alexa to work with various other products to, to help people out and i'm just really really excited about where smart technology is going i think there's lots of things that you could change about it and things don't quite work as they ought to so for example uh, my wife and I are going out later tonight, but I, I, I can't ask Alexa when is the next bus that runs down my road. Mm. It, it, it can't, it can't do that. But there are so many skills that are being added every single, every single week that eventually there will be a skill which says, okay, the bus is in five minutes, or actually the bus is running late. It's now in in eight minutes so i certainly think smart technology and although it wasn't designed for people with disabilities or, or disabled people is actually great for everybody would, would, would you agree chris i i i definitely i i think so i mean the 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 developments you've got i mean on we've just recently had a kitchen refit and um we we very much looked at having uh something like voice controlled ovens which at the moment uh, they are available they're a bit cost prohibitive but in in the next few years these are the types of things which will probably become the mainstays uh in in when you're buying things for for you know kitchen appliances or ovens and things like that um yeah and just having I, I think again i wouldn't be able to use if it wasn't for apple's voiceover i wouldn't be able to use my mobile phone anymore and so to have these these tools uh, in place uh, are are brilliant. And and I mean, talking about other sort of assistive texts, and much like yourself, Maria, my son, he will always read, or he will always have subtitles on. In fact, he gets very frustrated when the subtitles get turned off. Um, he also gets frustrated when audio description is turned on. And so there's there's normally a bit of a battle in our house over who who gets control on how we watch the TV. But um, uh, and, and, and my wife, I mean, she's a big audio book fan. She, she's, she, she doesn't really do reading of books, but she loves to sit and listen to an audio book. So, you know, in those two instances very much, um, you know, as a, th thanks to the sort of development for for disabled communities, uh, it really has helped others in, in, in different ways there. Yeah, I, I really agree with that, actually, Chris. And I think when I started um, in education, we used to try and ask children to use speech input and it was just really, really poor. It didn't recognise voices and now it's just so integrated into everything that we're using. So like using our phones and I'll use, I'll use my voice just to turn on the torch if I'm coming home late at night so that I can put the key in the lock, you know, and, and uh, I don't have to hunt around to try and turn that on my phone or I don't have to have another gadget with me. But now you're saying actually it's now integrated more into your kitchen as well. So I think it just shows you how far we've come and how fast that's happened as well. And we're accepting it as, as the norm 
norm now. So the cost of implementing some of these strategies are going down and down. It used to be incredibly expensive to put in some of this technology, but because everybody's using it now, it's just an everyday thing. So it's far, far cheaper for us to start using the technology that's going to be useful for everybody uh, uh, as well, regardless of disability. I think it's great. Definitely. I've got a very functional question for the panel. So this is this is about text description on on images. What text is useful to include on image description? Is is a longer or shorter description best? Is is something that's kind of very functional and bare bones? What what's sort of the best way to describe an image? For me, I love the context. I, I love to have you know if if there's a bit of background as to the reason why the image was taken. Anything, I suppose, obviously, the first and foremost, you have to be you have to be describing what is on, you know, what what is in that image. But you shouldn't just limit it to a person standing in front of a, you know, a person standing in front of a house or something like that. It, you should, if there's context, if there's background, then build it in. You know, it's and actually, you know, if it's, I I, I saw one piece of alt text which was, you know, something like a cat just sat sat on, you know, and and. It was actually really funny because it almost built into the cat looking at the screen and it looks like he's about to attack you or something like that. But actually, you know, build build that in. I mean, I think the key is so long as you have that audio, the, the, the description of the image correct, and also don't shy away from describing things like colour of skin and ethnicity and stuff like that, because it all adds context. Um, but make sure what, what, what you do see sometimes is people may use alt text as another way of sharing a message and it doesn't describe the image stay away from that but really you know describe the image but have fun with it they, they always it always brings a smile to my face especially I, I, I can agree more chris i think context is really really important so for example if i took a picture of, of my dog and put it on twitter i i might be saying okay this is bella she um She's black in colour, she's sitting on her favourite blanket. It's no good just saying this is a dog. Yeah. But because you've got you you you've got no context at all. And I think because you um because you might not have any vision, you you still really want to know what what your image is. It's no good just um annoying people just by thinking, well they're blind they're not going to want to know what your image is you've just got to give the person so much context because they've got a right to know what their image is haven't they and and it's describing it by words rather than sight hmm. okay i'm so pleased i asked that question now it makes me want to take more images and add more description but i fear as a ex-literature student you may have a novel on your hands <laughs> alongside the image um there were some nice observations in the chat that i'm just going to, to to share with you all um so um one observation was as a software developer keyboard navigation has a huge positive impact on efficiency so really agreeing there with you alex and and teresa and then a comment about slide 3.2 it's about doing actions that make things work better rather than just a diversity statement and no action. And I think we probably all have experiences of where there's been a diversity statement, but actually it's very difficult to see where the levels of support and accessibility swinging to. Mm. Um, there's a really good question about um, visual impairment and perceptual range. So the question is, how does the 20 times, uh, sorry, the, the 20 slash X definition of, of vision impairment correlate to glasses prescription numbers, if at all? So the slide that you were showing with the different numbers. For the for Snellen chart. I couldn't go into more detail on that, unfortunately. <laughs> I, haven't got, I haven't got that much information uh, on it. I just know the sort of the difference between yeah. sort of. And, you know, glasses don't always correct vision. So, you know, you might you might think that just by giving somebody a pair of glasses, it's going to oh, suddenly make a massive difference. But it's not. It's not always about glasses that are needed. So, um, yeah, there's lots of other conditions that actually glasses aren't going to be the answer. Uh, I yeah, I, I think I, I would agree with that one. Again, I think, that, as you say, the Snellen chart, that's what you'd read when you go to your go to the opticians um last uh, and 
you know, you, you need to be, I think, to be in order to be able to drive, you need to be able to read that line of, of I think it's 612, uh, so, or, or I think that's 2040. Um, and uh, the, but the actual prescription, like minus 10 or minus four or something like that, that that's just, that's basically the lens and what needs to be done in order to bring your site down to the level where you can read at the best, to, to, to the best of your ability, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that you know when we think about visual conditions, you you you've got sometimes you have tunnel vision, sometimes you don't have the peripheral vision, sometimes you've got floaters, and glasses aren't aren't going to make any difference to that at all. And uh, you know, it it might be that you need to have a smaller screen rather than a larger screen. So don't just assume that it's going to be a big screen is the answer, a, a larger monitor, a larger font size. It's not always the case. It might be that you need a smaller screen as well. So, you know, it does surprise you at times as to the type of adjustment that's required. Uh, and the other point that I would make is, I know from my experience that glasses won't make your vision 2020, mm -hmm. you know, it, course glasses will improve your vision but it may not be enough to be able to do things like driving and just an observation that quite a lot of us on this call are wearing glasses and mine is for standard short-sightedness but also i'm dyslexic and what my optician recommended was colored lenses and that's made a huge difference text doesn't float around anymore or do weird things like, you know, move across the screen. Um, or it, okay, it still kind of does, but not as bad as it used to. Um, so you're right. And that that makes a huge difference. Um, yeah. me. And, and blue tinted glasses as well, so that you don't get that blue light from your computer. So if you get migraines a lot um, when you're reading the computer screen, see if you can have a look at the uh, the uh, blue tinted glasses as well for computer use. Yeah. made a massive difference to me. And unfortunately, you know, as we age, mm -hmm. our eye condition does deteriorate. So uh, you notice more and more people wearing glasses as 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 we age as well. So um, yeah, it's just one of those things, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I, I use the blue tinted glasses myself as well all the time. I mean, I have actually got uh, I, I, I have implanted contact lenses, which are um, another technical probably a story, conversation for another day, but they were. They were done because of my my short sightedness is is at a point where it's um, you know my my prescription is very low uh, and so the the lenses are working absolutely perfectly to fix the problem at the front of the eye but unfortunately the signals being received at the back is is where the issue is so I could have the most powerful pair of glasses in the world or the absolute perfect pair of glasses and it doesn't actually make any kind of difference to mm. my to my ability to see anymore, unfortunately. And uh, so a couple more questions and one observation as well. So a thank you for raising the language issue. Uh, I think this is directed in particular at Alex. This is helpful. So the nice to see usually find, but you know, blind drunk or blind even the blind, more negative and to avoid. And then a final question to the panel, and I, I just lost the chat, so there are more questions in the chat. Please, Marianne and Yo, let me know. But the, the final question on the pad that I can see is um, first an observation by someone. So they feel stuck between two worlds. They have a sight disability, so they have their uh, have partial vision. They can see people, but they can't drive. And their question is, is it normal for me to feel like I'm using my disability in, in a bad way? And does anyone else... And, and how does anyone else deal with this feeling? Um, so I think they're picking up on the point that they don't feel disabled enough, if that makes sense, um, in terms of in terms of their disability. What what's the panel's experience of that? I can sorry, I, I, I can honestly say I get a bit of imposter syndrome a lot, and it's it's funny because it is something which, especially if you're visually impaired, but you don't have it, it's a really difficult question, but I, I, I completely sympathise with with the individual who's raised that because it is something which can be can be difficult because you do think that sometimes you go, you know, am I leaning on this too much? I mean, do I, for example, I, I always book assistance to go on the train so I have somebody meet me at my local train station to help me get on board and travel, navigate through the network safely. 
And there are times when I go, do I really need this assistant? Am I just playing on it? But I do because the times when I don't have those people, when they don't turn up or there's an error or it's, I'm, I'm traveling uh, uh, as a sort of, as a late, late planning or something like that, those individuals are missed and things do get dangerous. So I would say, and it's not just that, but it's like when using my screens, I mean, I spent for ages uh, um, being quite reluctant to go for any additional technology. I mean, I, I used access to work to uh, get the technology. I use Zoom Text Fusion, which is a combination of the magnification and the JAWS speech uh, technology. I've got large screens, I've got um, desktop readers and stuff, which are all developed and all provided to me as part of access to work. And they have made things so much easier. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be able to do my job. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I would say, you know, but I still get those days when I do get that feeling of, am I, you know, am I taking advantage? Am I, you know, do I really, dare I say it, do I really deserve this? And I would say, if it helps, and if it does make that difference, and I'd say then really you do deserve it, you do need it, because it's the only way that you can lead what people might lie, might call a normal life, you know, in order to be able to, um, in order to be able to, to to adapt to things which you otherwise may not be able to do. Mm. It's, it's very likely that it's a transition phase as well, wouldn't you say, Chris? It's so you, you've, you've, your, your world is changing so at one point you were very independent but you're changing and learning to use different assistive technologies different ways of working different ways of sort of being within your environment so it is a it it's a change in time so yeah I, th I think you've you've been brilliant with what you've said there Chris actually and to um yeah don't don't focus too much about worrying about having that help there because it will make a massive difference and also you know that will create your independence again and uh yeah so it, it, it's about transitioning uh, uh, and uh, i just want to add something else when when i was office based i'm now lucky enough to work from home now but when i was office based i used access to work to enable me to get to work with uh in, in a taxi mm -hmm. if i used public transport it would have taken me almost an hour and a half and and uh, sometimes I have issues with, with fatigue, so I I could it would take me twenty minutes or twenty five minutes to take a ten a ten mile journey, and it just made things so much better. And I was able to work to a high standard in the office. And I think sometimes you feel embarrassed that you actually need access to work support and mm -hmm. things like that. What I would say is don't feel embarrassed. There's there's support out there. You've just got to you've just got to find out what you're eligible and you've got and, and you've got to take it with both hands because it it is actually there for you. Mm. Yeah. It makes a big difference because actually, you know, that hybrid working and working from home, if you are worried about going into work, like Alex said, he was getting tired and um, fatigued, getting into work, that anxiety of thinking I've got to get back home again as well is still sitting with you. So that's mm -hmm. going to sort of be your focus towards the end of the day as well. So it takes away that concentration from work too, because you're worried about that journey. So access to work takes, alleviates that a little bit. But again, hybrid working is a, is a good reasonable adjustment too. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually written an article talking about, you know, sort of stages of grief and, and, um, uh, and again, from a personal perspective, sort of mental health and stages of grief going through uh sort of losing vision sort of over, over over time and and you know please feel free to take a look at that and might hopefully it, that 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 may help as well I'll, I'll find the link and i can share that please please do yeah i'd really welcome reading that hmm. um two more excellent questions so are there activist groups making noise to raise awareness and public policy action so any example of a public campaign by civil society that has had a positive or unexpected impact there's a lot led by uh, the RNIB. They they're very vocal. I think that they've been 
working quite hard, especially around voter registration, about making sure that you've got the correct uh, accesses for people with visual impairments to still be able to vote safely and securely and privately. Uh, they also, they, they recently uh, had a campaign which was um, to, to get a commitment to make all railways um, safer, so making sure tactile paving was installed on all railway platforms. So they're, they're quite a big advocate. You've also got other people, so uh, organisations like Pocklington Trust, um, they are very good at, at, at talking out they provide lots and lots of great advice and advocacy around working and students and 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 what accent and and you know good guides there uh there are charities like the vision foundation based out of london who are who are really um they, they're, they're constantly working to um talking about sight loss and about different again mental issues around sight loss there macular society focus on on research and everything for macular disease i mean the the, the list is actually endless there are there are so many um organizations out there uh, and, uh, another thing that Leon and I have been recently involved with is that they want electric cars to actually have some sort of yes. noise because I don't know whether you've ever been in an electric car. They're nice and quiet and that's great. But if you're a blind or possibly sighted person, you think there's nothing coming and uh, you know, there's a chance of you getting you're getting hit. And Jan and I have been really, really uh, vociferous in saying we need to do something. We need to do something about this because actually, it's it's a real it's a real safety issue. Yeah. Oh, who did we just lose? <laughs> I think we've just lost Maz. Um, that's okay. <laughs> We have yeah. other hosts here. Uh, ho hopefully, she'll be back soon. Once whatever. Ah, yay! You're back. <laughs> Your microphone's off. Okay, back. Hurrah! Um, <laughs> that was scary. Um, so, final question. And uh, if there are more questions coming in, please please put them in, into the document or into the chat. But the final question that that I can see is that. Um, many of the audience are software engineers or academics, and if you could tell them one thing to take away from the session, what would it be? So I, I would say um, from, from where AbilityNet stand, it's about assistive technology and uh, doing the accessibility checks and looking at WCAG and uh, you know, checking the websites and making sure everything that's shared is accessible. That's that's the biggest one where we would be concerned, I think. And and yeah, that's one of them. One of them. I could I could list lots actually. <laughs> Alex. Uh, sure. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, uh, I would say try using it without a mouse. Does it work without a mouse? Does it work with keyboard input? Because some people aren't gonna gonna use a mouse. And you've just got to think about all the different types of people who might use your application or might use your website and they're probably all going to access it in slightly different ways. That would be my top tip. I, I would agree with those, both of those and you know, as a product owner myself uh, working in software development, um, I think that on, on top of that it is key just to you know, engage with those user communities, engage with, get get you know, engage with visually impaired users to testing and and you know really uh, working working with those those people with the business users as well to just understand how uh, what 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 developments need to be done in order to make a truly accessible solution. Thank you. Those are really helpful. And we're adding them into, into our notepad and we'll share this with everyone after the event. Uh, and also you can see the notepad live if you're if you're if you're that way um, uh, navigated on the internet. Um, we've got one more question just sneaking in at the last moment, which is a very simple, straightforward one. Uh, should we avoid touch screens? No, I don't think so. I mean, I use so I use an iPhone and and um you know it's 
it needs to be used in a other way so you need to have the technology built into it in order for it to work but you shouldn't necessarily avoid it it just adds an extra level of complexity complexity when you're doing your design i i i agree with chris you know um having a touch screen is great especially if you've got a service user or people that you're working with who have never really used technology before, it's much easier to use than a, than a standard on computer. So uh, I, I'm a big fan of the touch screen. I've got an iPad and an iPhone, and uh, I think I think they're here to stay, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think with the touch screen as well, I mean, you can change the um the icon size so that uh, they're larger it's a hard an easier target to find rather than tracking a pointer across the street screen trying to find that so yeah but again one size doesn't fit all so it's up to the individual as to which one they they find easiest to use basically at the end of the day thank you chris alex and Teresa. thank you so much for your time today thank you for your contributions and your talks and your patience at the beginning and thank you to, to everyone all our attendees as well for tolerating uh the beginning of getting into zoom uh and to coming together this afternoon um thank you so very much um that's the end of our webinar today and um, we'll make sure that we share all of the notes that we've been taking um, all of the links, um, we'll reshare um, links to AbilityNet where you can do some site checks. I've just checked my own website and it's woefully inadequate. Uh, and also links to Chris's blog as well. Um, and, you know, some more personal reflections on there. And I'm sure that you're all au fait with, with the world of social media. So I'm sure you can hunt out um, a bit everyone who's been on the call today uh, and get in touch if you'd like to follow up as well. Thanks so much for your time and to Marianne and to Yo as well for co-organizing this event. It's It's been a privilege to work with you all. Thank you. And thank you. Bye-bye. for doing. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Lots of care. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>